Again, you got a piece of paper with a question. Uh, is just out of curio- curiosity, is there anybody like struggling a little bit with this question? Like uh, nobody? Okay, a couple people. A couple people are. That's fine. I, I really just want to know what you think, okay? Uh, you don't have to sign it. I'm not going to tell anybody what you said or any, anything weird like that, okay? So today is the second lesson in our series that we're calling, oh, I know that one, but what does it mean? And it's really about Bible verses that we think we know. And... Uh, We're looking at Bible verses that are, like I said last week, they're already taking up room in our head. We know them. We know what they say. And we're just seeing if there's anything new that we can learn from them. Or maybe have have we misunderstood this, or maybe there's just something new that you can learn. Last week, we talked about Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Even if you weren't here, you probably know it. It says, trust in the Lord. Stay with me. With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Most of you know some version of that verse. So familiar. And so last week we asked the question, what does it mean to acknowledge God? And so we looked at this Hebrew word that we translate to acknowledge, which is the word yada, and Odessa made a good point, you know, it's like yada, 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 like I know, I know, I know, right? So we look at this word yada, and we learn that it actually means to know God, to know him, to trust him, to honor him, to know what he's like, to know what makes him happy, to know what makes him sad, to understand God. We learn there's quite a bit that goes into acknowledging God. So I encourage you, there's more to learn. If you didn't get to watch that last week, um, I encourage you, go back and watch it. It's on Facebook, it's on YouTube, um, and I think it's actually even going to help with what we're going to be talking about today. So today's passage is going to be really interesting. Because I think this is one of, it might be the most misused, and, and I believe misinterpreted and mistaught verses of all time, I think. But we all know it. So it would probably be wise of us to question whether or not we really understand what it means and see if there's anything else new that we can learn from it. So don't put it on the screen yet, Caleb. Our verse for today is Psalms 37.4. Anybody know it just from the reference? You'll know it when I start to say it. Chris raised her hand like it was a bad thing. She's like, that's a good thing. I'm bad with references too, but you guys are going to know what it says. Say it with me as it rings a bell. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Man, you can put it up there now, Caleb. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. How many of you heard that one before? Everybody, I'm sure. Doesn't this sound good? This sounds so good. It sounds to me like if I can somehow draw my joy and my happiness and all those kind of things from God, that he's going to give me what my heart desires. Or he'll give me what my heart wants. This sounds good. And this is how I've heard it interpreted many times. After all, that's what it sounds like it's saying, right? So maybe the reason that I'm not getting an olive gold Harley Road King that's blacked out is because I'm not delighting enough in the Lord. If I was delighting enough in the Lord, then maybe he would allow this to happen. Or maybe he would even make a way for this to happen. So if 
you don't have all the things that your heart desires, then it's an indication maybe that you're not delighting enough in the Lord. Or at least that's how I've heard it explained. Maybe you have too. It's funny that it's usually coming from preachers who have what they want. (laughs) So it makes us seem like they're right. I mean, I've heard this interpreted by some preachers who own an airplane. And I don't even have my olive gold Harley Road thing. So maybe I'm just not delighting in the Lord as much as they are or something. Allow me to force you to reconsider that interpretation, can I? This is what it says. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Talking about your heart. And then, Chris, she knows where I'm going. The, heart, the Bible describes your heart in a very strange but very detailed way. This is what it says in Jeremiah 17.9. The heart, some translations say the human heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then it asks, who can even know it? Hmm. Desperately wicked, evil. Another way that this could be translated is the human heart is incurably sick. Because of the sins of Adam and Eve, you inherited a heart that is incurably sick. The wicked human heart is going to desire things that go directly against God's will for your life. It's going to desire things that go directly against things that God has even commanded of us. To say that God is going to grant every desire that your wicked, deceitful, incurably sick heart has, it would mean that God would have to go against who he is to grant it well obviously god's not going to grant you the wicked desires he's only going to grant the good ones you know the the ones that make you happy but aren't bad i've heard it that way too i just think it's baloney because i don't believe this has anything to do at all with stuff for a long time king solomon he wasn't delighting himself in the lord you know what he delighted himself in stuff women horses gold all this stuff he delighted himself in stuff and guess what he still got everything he ever wanted and right before he died what did he say everything is meaningless everything basically everything that my evil wicked uncurably sick heart ever desired is meaningless one of the smartest things he ever said this really has nothing to do with stuff so what does it mean Because I still see in this verse that there's a promise. And there's a command. So I think it's super important that we try to understand both of them. This version of this verse is 16 words long, man. And I have spent years pondering this verse. Every time I hear it, trying to figure out what it really means means because I just know that there have been people that are explaining this wrong. And over the years, I think God has taught me new things about these 16 words, and I believe that this week, he taught me even more. After years of thinking about it, man, that's how good God is. And kind of understanding it, 
I think he's given me a complete new revelation about this verse. And there's a chance that he might even do the same thing for you today. Act like you don't know what this verse means for a minute. Let's get started. To do that, I want to know, what does it mean to delight in the Lord? So I'm going to ask, uh, is John in here? John, if you wouldn't mind, if, if you would all pass your little piece of paper this way, all of you would pass your little piece of paper this way. John's going to come up this aisle and collect them. Lori, would you grab these ones? So if you, if you wrote an answer, pass it down to the end of the aisle and uh, give it. I want to see what some of you guys have to say about what it means to delight in the Lord. Because I should have done this last week with acknowledgement. I think a lot of us are going to have a little bit different answer, okay? So let's, let's look at a couple of them. I'll take those. Pick up. Megan can keep hers. That's probably wrong. Kidding. <laughs> okay, so what does it mean to delight in the Lord? This one says... To be thankful and grateful for everything he does for me. And let it show. Hmm, I like that addition. To let it show. This one says, it means bask in the joy he brings to your life. Soak in his light and love and to spread the light to others. Okay. You guys wrote a lot more than I thought you were going to, actually. Let's see. I'm not going to read all of them. This one says, to enjoy spending time in prayer and in his word. Okay, so we're seeing some different answers. Okay, and I think these are all good answers. Let's see. This one says, to absolutely know, underlined, that he loves you, that he yearns and wants to relate with me, that he has me, uh, to meditate on his promise, to meditate on his promise. Okay, maybe, maybe a couple more. One says simply, peace. This one says to see him in the big and the little things and to be aware of his presence and enjoy it. Okay, a few different answers. Let's, let's examine it even further, okay? According to Webster, to delight means to take great pleasure in something or to get joy and satisfaction from something. I think that's a pretty good starting point. I think a lot of the stuff that I just read is a pretty good starting point. I'm looking forward to reading all of those things this week. Thanks for doing that. This is a good starting point. In fact, this is uh, really what I thought this meant for a really long time. But now I'm learning that this is just a layer of what it means. So, to take great pleasure in who God is. And to find joy and satisfaction in God. I think that that is a good starting point. Like I said, I think one time as I was meditating on this, on this verse, um, I know for sure. You know, I didn't hear God speak out loud, but I believe he said to me, I am the most pleased with you when you're the most pleased in me. Make sense? I'm the most pleased with you when you're the most pleased in me. I think that God has to be the biggest source of satisfaction and joy in your life. And if there's anything else that's a bigger source of joy and a bigger source of satisfaction in your life, then, then you have your priorities mixed up. But this is just a layer, man, of what we're talking about. What does it mean to truly delight in the Lord? I think many of us, including myself sometimes, and even some of these answers would indicate this. I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm just saying it's only part of it. 
But I think many of us, including myself sometimes, have confused delighting in the Lord with delighting in the attributes of the Lord. And I'm going to explain that. His goodness, his kindness, his love, his mercy, his providence, right? Give me what my heart desires, God. I know you can do it. So do it. But I think you have to be very careful, guys, about simply delighting in the individual attributes of God. Because if you find your delight in the individual attributes of God, there's a chance you may only start to delight in the attributes of God that you're fond of. You hear what I'm saying? There's a difference. This verse is about delighting in who God is. Not just your favorite things about Him. You see the difference? Over the years, I've talked to lots of married couples. Lots of married couples who are having problems. Even before I was a pastor, it's just kind of weird. I love helping married couples who are struggling, and I think I'm kind of good at it. And uh, one time there was this couple that I was talking to, and one day the wife was really upset because her husband couldn't tell her why he loved her. Why do you love me? You say you love me. Tell me why. And she's, she's like getting really upset. Tell me why. Tell me why you love me. Tell me why you love me. You say you love me. Tell me why. Give me a reason. Finally, he gave the, like the most man answer possible. He, uh, he said, I don't know. You're my wife. I just do. And she was so mad. She was so mad with his answer. According to her, she did so much for him. And he couldn't even think of a good reason why he loved her. What a pig. She wanted specifics, man. But, listen. When I finally got her to calm down a second, I said, you know, if you think about it, he might have given you one of the best answers possible. You know what I mean? You're my wife, so I just do. What did you want to hear, lady? I love you because you cook for me, because you clean my house, because you take care of my kids, because you make me happy, because of what you can do for me. Those are things he appreciates about you. Those are things he loves about you. But he loves you because you're his wife, and he just does. That's a pretty good answer, ladies. When you're asking your husband, and he's like, I don't have specific, I don't know, I just love you. That's a pretty good answer. And before I could even finish what I was saying, she started tearing up. Because for some reason it made sense coming out of my mouth. And he was just kind of trembling, saying, I just love you. <laughs> I think she went to hug him and he's going, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Guys, we have to learn to delight in God just because he's God. Not because of what he's capable of doing for us. We have to be careful about that. There's a big difference. And I think the only way that you can truly delight in God, simply for being God, is through what we talked about last week. So you got to go watch it. Yada. Getting to know him, really know him. To know what he's like, what he loves, what he doesn't like. To trust him, to honor him, to submit to him. Without that, you're never going to delight in the Lord just simply for being Yahweh, as it's written. Just for being God. But again, this is just a layer of what it means to delight in Him. You're going to see. Let me show you. We're going to look again at the original text and the word that we translate as Delight. You want to know what delight means? The word is 
agon, I think is how it's pronounced. And the real meaning of this word might surprise you. I'm going to take a drink and build suspense. Because I'm thirsty. Ready? The word agon means to be soft and pliable and delicate. What? This word might be used to describe a lump of clay in the hands of a potter. Are you getting the picture? It really means to be moldable. Be moldable in the Lord. Allow him to mold you, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. We're getting a little closer, do you see? Be soft, be pliable. Allow God to change you because he's God, man. Not because of what he can do for you. Last week was about getting to know God. This week is about allowing him to change you. And I think that the two really have to go together. Because I think the more you get to know God, the more you have to let him change you. You have to. Here's what David says about being moldable, soft, and pliable, I think. Pay real close attention here. Psalms 119, starting in verse 1, it says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord, Yahweh. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. That's called Yada. They do not compromise with evil. Guess what else it says? And they walk only in his paths. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. I love this part. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. Are you thankful? I will obey your decrees. And then he says, please, please, God, don't give up on me. I know I mess up sometimes. And then if you keep reading, it says in verse 16, he says, I delight. I delight in your decrees. David was really good about remembering the good things that God can do for him and has done for him. We learned that in Psalm 103. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all of our iniquities, who heals all of our diseases, who redeems my life from destruction. See, he remembers that stuff. But he's also really good about allowing God to change him because he's God. He remembers the rules too, guys. The commands. He says, I will not be ashamed when he compares his life to God's commands. He says this because he knows that the more he knows God, the more he understands him and what he's like, the more he delights in all the things of God, not just his favorite things, and the more he lets it mold him, the more his life will mirror God's commands. Or his actions will reflect God's decrees. This isn't just about getting what you want. See? What this is really about, and I'm going to show you. Even though this is in the Old Testament, this is what this is really about. This is about being transformed to be more like Jesus himself. I'll show you. Delighting in the Lord starts with accepting Jesus. I'm going to show you. 
In John chapter 5, Jesus is talking to these uh, religious leaders, and he's basically saying things to them like, look, guys, you've seen me do miracles. You've seen it yourself. You know, I sent John the Baptist to pave the way for me. You have all of this evidence. And then in verse 40, he says, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. It's not that they cannot come to Jesus or they cannot accept Jesus. It's that they won't accept Jesus. They choose not to. And the first step to delighting in the Lord or Yahweh, the God, of the specific God, guys, the God, the first step is accepting Jesus. Look at what he says to them. In John 5, 42, starting in verse 42, he says, But I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I know you don't. Guys, you can't delight in something that you don't love. That's just simple math or something. You can't delight in something you don't love. And Jesus says, look, I know you guys don't have the love of God in you. You know how I know? He goes on to say, because I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. And you can't have one without the other. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus says that this is serious. This is serious. Jesus says, if you don't receive me, if you don't accept me, it's proof that the love of God is not in you. Do you see that? You can't delight in something you don't love. So the first step in being able to delight in the Lord is accepting Jesus. Right there. Because it's really about being transformed to be more like him. I'm going to show you. This is so good, guys. Pay attention. Let me show you where Jesus says something that I think completely mirrors the verse that we're talking about this week. Psalms 37, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord. Be moldable. Allow God to make you more like him. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. And then let's look at what Jesus says in John 15, 7. This is also about how we get what we want, it it appears. This is what it says. Jesus says himself, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. Do you see the parallel? Maybe I'm just really slow. Because I never put the two together like I did this week. If you abide in me, if, I would say if is one of the biggest words in the Bible. If you abide in me, if my words abide in you, ask and you will get what you want. So it sounds to me like if I abide in him and I become more like him, and I do good things, I'll get what my heart desires. It's sounding better, isn't it? In other words, do good things, and good things will come to me. Heard that one before? Sorry to burst your bubble, guys. That's called karma, and I think karma is baloney. Then how can these verses be true? Pay really close attention to the end here. Delighting in the Lord changes the desires of your heart. Your desires begin to align with God's desire. See? His desires for you, his desires for humanity, for your neighbors, for your enemies, for lost people. Delighting in the Lord or being soft and pliable toward God transforms your desires. 
being moldable to God brings your desires into conformity with God's desires. You see what I'm saying? He gives you the desires. He gives you new desires. And if you're abiding in Jesus, you're becoming more like Jesus. And Jesus' words are abiding in you. Guess what happens? His words will start to come out of you. And you'll begin to pray the way Jesus would pray. And you'll begin to pray for the things that Jesus would pray for. And when that happens, guess what happens? You start to see your prayers answered regularly. Your real heart's desires, your new heart's desires. He gives them to you because they align with his. You see that? It is about getting what you want. Just not what you want now, maybe. Getting what you want after you allow him to mold you to be more like Jesus. After you abide in Jesus and Jesus' words are abiding in you. You'll de- receive the desires because your desires will be different. I don't think, this breaks my heart a little bit. I don't think Jesus is going to pray for a olive gold blacked out Harley Road King pony. So maybe that's not that important. Last week, I I said uh, some things that uh, caught some people off guard, I think. You know, I said, uh, God, I think sometimes lets us choose for ourselves the paths that we want to take. You know, he says, you, you decide. But I also think that through yada, through knowing him, understanding him, understanding all these things about him, and through a gone that we're talking about today, being moldable to him, there's a really good chance that you're going to start choosing the paths that he would have picked for you in the first place. You see how that works? You know, like, God's like, yeah, make a, make a choice. It's probably going to be a good one, right? David said that obedient people only walk in the paths of the Lord. Good stuff. Be soft and moldable to God. Allow him to make you more like Jesus. And he'll give you new desires of your heart. You'll begin to pray the way Jesus would pray and for the things that Jesus would pray for. And then you'll start to see your prayers answered on a regular basis. I really believe that. You know, Paul, if you want to come up, he says that the human heart is incurably sick. And I think it's in Ezekiel where, where God is talking to his people, and you know what he says to them? I'll take your stony heart, your hard heart, your heart that is not moldable, that's not soft, that's not delicate, that's not pliable, I will take your heart of stone and I'll give you a new one, a fleshy heart, a soft, pliable, delicate heart. See how good he is? So good. And it starts with accepting Jesus. Because you cannot Delight in Yahweh without accepting Jesus. I said it. I know you don't have the love of God in you because you haven't accepted me. You you won't receive me. I wasn't planning it on this morning, but I'm going to ask everybody to close your eyes, bow your heads. And I'm going to ask you a question. If you have never accepted Jesus, you never received Jesus as your Savior, but you want to today and you say, man, I want to I wanna accept Jesus and I want to become more like Jesus. I want to delight in the Lord so that I can receive joy and I can be satisfied. 
I want to accept Jesus today. I want to receive Jesus today. I'm deciding today. I'm going to ask you to put your hand up real quick and put it back down. Pretty awesome. And again, I always do this, but if you've been mixed up a little bit, maybe you haven't been living the way that you should, maybe your heart's desires you know for sure are not aligning aligning with God's desires for you and you would admit that maybe you're not being moldable and soft and delicate towards God would you say man I I want I want that for me and so maybe I haven't been serving Jesus the way that I should and I just want I just want to accept him again I'm going to ask you to raise your hand real quick and keep it back down. Awesome. Talked about it during communion today. God's so good. If He just if He just lets you come to Him, confess your sin, repent again. You gotta mean it. Not just words. When you repent of sin, it means you're going to turn your back on it and you're going to start to be more like Jesus. That's what it means. It says, when you do that, I just, I'll just forgive you. Like it never happened. So if you raised your hand, I want you to take this real serious. And if you didn't raise your hand, why don't you just repeat it with us? Let's all say this prayer together. Dear God. Thank you for loving me. I know that I've sinned against you. And I'm sorry. I turn my back on that sin. And I turn to you. I believe that you sent your son to die for me. I believe that you raised him from the dead. I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. God, mold me. Make me more like Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm going to have Paul play just for a couple minutes of contemplation. If you want to come up to the altar, it's open. I'm actually, I'm going to just ask the prayer partners to come up right now this morning. And if you have a prayer request that has nothing to do with anything we talk about, it doesn't matter. Any kind of prayer request. I ask you to come on up. We want to pray with you. I mean, we, we believe that prayer works. We believe that God is moving and moving in people's lives in our church and moving through people in our church co-workers of people in our church God's doing things because of you guys and your obedience to him if you have any kind of prayer requests at all come on up we're going to pray for you but I'm going to allow Paul to play for just a couple minutes as we just examine ourselves as the Bible says and then I'll come up and close and then you'll be dismissed come down fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing of you. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some of your sonnets. Some by flaming tongues above. Grace of Fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come, and I hold. Thy good pleasure save me to arrive at home. Jesus.
Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious Bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. As we close, why don't we all stand together? Pray together like a family. Let's pray. God, we just thank you again. Simply for who you are, Lord. Thank you for your great plan. God, we do remember all of the good things that you can do for us. We do remember all the good things that you have done for us, Lord. But God, we just thank you so much that just that you're God and that you have a plan. That you have rules for a reason. and You have decrees for a reason. So we even delight in those things. God, I pray that we would be reminded every day to examine ourselves so that if we compare our lives to your commands, that we would not be ashamed. God, we pray that our lives would reflect your decrees as we allow you to mold us and to change us to be more like Jesus. God, I pray that all those things that popped in our heads today as we were praying, as we were sitting through service, I pray that all those things that popped in our head that we know don't align with your will for our lives, God, that we would change those things. No matter how hard it is, We would change those things, Lord, that this would be the day. That this would be the day that we would decide, I want my life and I want my actions to reflect your decrees. And I want to be more like Jesus. And I want to delight in you better, God. And then we would seek help if we need it, but we would do the things to change these things in our lives that are not honoring to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And we love you guys. We'll see you next week. Please, please, please sign up for the parade in the back. We, we want as many people at that as we can get. And hey, do something crazy. And invite somebody to church next week.